September 11th was a tragic, terrible catalyst for me to get going in this service life. And as I did more, I would see more need. And so I would want to do more. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. This week, we talk with two men whose lives have been changed by a commitment to serve God and serve others. Actor and humanitarian Gary Sinise and pastor and former NFL player Dr. Derwin Gray. We caught up with actor Gary Sinise in February of 2019 to talk about what moves him to live in service to others. For nearly 40 years, he has stood as an advocate of America's service members, starting in the 80s with the support of Vietnam veterans groups and the creation of Vets Night, a program offering free dinners and performances to veterans at the Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. Since the attacks of September 11, 2001, Gary was moved to do even more for our nation's active duty defenders, veterans, and first responders. His portrayal of Lieutenant Dan Taylor in the landmark film Forrest Gump formed an enduring connection with servicemen and women throughout the military community. He shares the story of how he found his way to becoming an actor and why helping those on the front lines who defend and protect our country is so important, which he details in his book, Grateful American, A Journey from Self to Service. I am Gary Sinise. I'm an actor, director, produced a movies and television. I'm the co-founder of Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. I'm the founder of the Gary Sinise Foundation, which is a military and first responder service organization. We serve and honor the needs of our veteran community, our active duty, our Gold Star families, our wounded, our first responders. Uh, so I've been uh, very, very active with supporting that for many, many years. Founder of the Lieutenant Dan Band, uh, which entertains our troops and first responders and raises awareness and uh, raises spirits on military bases all across the country and overseas. So I've been pretty busy with all that. Story of my family service in the military, uh, where I'm from, uh, where I came from, where my ancestors came from, our, my being born on the south side of Chicago, living there for many years, and then moving to the north side, falling into a, a bit of a troubled situation as a young person, struggling in school academically. Uh, this was the late 60s and early 70s, so uh, there's some bad behavior going on then uh, with me, and I discover acting, and I fall into it almost by accident. I was playing music from the time I was in fourth grade all the way up until my early 20s, so I was playing music in high school, had a high school band. I happened to be standing in a hallway with the band members and the drama teacher walked down the hall and she looked at me and she told me to come audition for West Side Story because she thought I looked good for a gang member. So <laughs> I ended up going in and auditioning for the play and I got in the play and it turned my whole life in another direction, completely turned my life around. All of a sudden, this struggling kid academically who was having nothing but trouble and uh, getting very close to being uh, kicked out of school and all these things. Life started to turn around. All I wanted to do was theater from that point on. And then as soon as I got out of high school, I started a theater company with kids. That theater grew into Steppenwolf Theater uh, of Chicago, which is now 45 years old. We owned four buildings. We built two of them from the ground up, renovated the other two. We're about to break ground on another one. This is a great American success story where you simply start out with a passionate desire to do something and a love and a commitment and a perseverance and a determination just to work hard and get in there because you love it and it turns into an internationally recognized theater company with many, many prominent actors coming out of that company over the years. So I look back at that and I go, wow, you know. I wonder how other 18-year-old kids feel when they walk into this building and they see these pictures up on the wall and they see these kids. And this whole big giant theater institution in Chicago started with just kids with a dream. And of course from there I move into the television and movie business and uh, get some significant parts that change my life and change the course of my life at once yet again. And then there's a significant event of September 11, 2001, when our country is attacked and our men and women start raising their hand to uh, deploy 
in reaction to that terrible event, and I just felt compelled and called in a certain way to serve. And so you go from this uh, singular focus on self to this broader focus on serving others, and so a lot of that is in the book uh, Grateful American. Uh, I am a grateful American. I'm grateful for so many things. I've had a lot of bumps along the way, a lot of challenges, a lot of difficult moments, not only uh, in the career life, but at home, in the personal life, and I document some of those in Grateful American. But uh, the service life has taken over so much of what I'm doing now that uh, I wanted to track that journey and how I got there. And I think it's a, a good telling of a story of a kid who was really kind of on his own trying to figure things out to somebody who's developed into a full-time advocate for our veterans. So I come from a family of veterans. My grandfather served in World War I. He was an ambulance driver in France during the Battle of the Argonne, which was one of the most devastating battles our country's ever faced. Over 26,000 Americans killed, many, many more wounded. And my grandfather drove an ambulance on the front lines back and forth with our wounded. He had three sons. He came home, went to work on the railroad on the south side of Chicago, had three sons. And my dad was the youngest. His two older brothers served in World War II. One was a navigator on a B-17 bomber over Europe. The other was uh, on a ship in the Pacific uh, the last year of the war. So he was actually there when the Japanese surrendered uh, in the Pacific. And then my dad served in the Navy in the early 50s. Uh, I met and married uh, my wife, Moira, and through her, I met her brothers, who both served in Vietnam. One was a combat assault helicopter pilot. Another was a West Point graduate who went as a platoon leader, a lieutenant, to Vietnam and then came home and then went back again as a captain, a company commander. Came home, uh, taught at West Point as a major, and then he was teaching at Fort Leavenworth as a lieutenant colonel when he was diagnosed with cancer and passed away in 1983. My wife's sister served in the Army. She met a Vietnam veteran who stayed in the Army for 22 years, a combat medic. They had a son who served in Afghanistan, two deployments in Afghanistan. A lot of veterans in my family, so all the veteran work kind of begins with the family. Then I started supporting Vietnam veterans in Chicago in the early 80s in various ways. Then, you know, when I found out I could audition for Forrest Gump to play a wounded Vietnam veteran, I very much wanted to do that. I jumped at that at the chance. I got the part. I played Lieutenant Dan. That led me to an association with the Disabled American Veterans Organization, the DAV, that goes back 25 years now uh, to 1994 when I attended their national convention and befriended many, many wounded veterans uh, who had served in various wars going back to World War II. Uh, and then after September 11th, when we were attacked and the buildings came down, so many died, so many people raised their hands to, uh, to serve their country. September 11th was a Tuesday, and then on, on, uh, President Bush declared that Friday was going to be a national day of prayer for the nation. Churches and synagogues, I mean, you name it, everything was packed everywhere. People were pouring into the churches all over the country. And we went to our little church, and there was no room to sit. Everybody was standing, and I was standing against the wall with my kids and my wife, and we're standing against the wall, it's packed. And I remember I needed something that day, and the priest gave me everything I needed that day. I came out of there with this feeling that I was gonna be called to do something to help this situation. And having veterans in my family, having been involved with uh, supporting Vietnam veterans. I just, I knew where I was going to employ my services and it was going to be to help our men and women get through the next phase of deploying to the war zones and 
helping them and their families get through that. And that just, that lit a fire under me. I knew that service would help heal that broken heart that I felt. And I got that message from the priest that day somehow. That message came to me. I can't remember everything he said except the first thing he said, which was, this has been a tough week. We all knew what he was talking about because it was a tough week. And it was a tough time. But the more I got active, the more I gave, the more I healed, you know. And then the more I wanted to do. And I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know how it was going to evolve. I just knew that I wanted to be a part of supporting the men and women who were reacting to that terrible day. One man I met on one of my first trips to Iraq was a firefighter. Uh, and a former Marine. And I sat down next to him. He had a button on his shirt. And the button had a picture of two people on it, one a firefighter, the other a police officer. And I asked him, what's the button? And he says, those are my sons. They were both killed on September 11th. And he was wearing a button of his sons. He gave me the button. And he reached into his backpack and pulled out a FDNY hat. And I took my USO hat off, put the FDNY hat on, and he invited me after the tour to Iraq to come to Brooklyn to visit the firehouse that his son was stationed at. They lost six, uh, six people that day from that firehouse. So I went there, and I befriended a whole bunch of folks from the FDNY who were still some of my best friends. This is back in 2003. And I started supporting them in various ways, just trying to help them through that. One of the things I got involved with was raising money to build a big 9-11 memorial uh, in Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Wall of Remembrance. And it has faces of 417 first responders on the wall that were lost that day. And I helped to raise the money to build that. And I just started raising my hand wherever I could to support multiple military charities that were trying to serve the needs of our veterans, our military community, our wounded, our Gold Star families, first responders, and ended up supporting maybe 30 different military and first responder support organizations. Through this 10, 15, 16 year period, I just kept doing more and more and more and it all evolved and manifested itself eventually into the creation of my own military veterans first responder support organization, the Gary Sinise Foundation. I remember feeling that service work would be a great healer for the broken heart that I felt for our country and for the people who were deploying in reaction to September 11th and for the September 11th families who lost loved ones. I, I was just grieving for, for, for all of that and needed to apply myself in some way. So I just started reaching out to all these different organizations who were doing multiple, you know, a variety of things. We're gonna do uh, a variety of things because I've seen the needs in all these different places and I wanna try to continue to help fill those needs. And now that we're going public, as a public charity, public nonprofit that the American people can support by making their donations, I want them to know that their generosity is going to help a lot of different people in a lot of different situations. So that's what the, you know, we're here to serve and honor the needs of the men and women who serve our country. Gary closes his time with us by reading a passage from Jesus Calling that speaks to how God works through us to bless others. I'm creating something new in you a bubbling spring of joy that spills over into others' lives. Do not mistake this joy for your own or try to take credit for it in any way. Instead, watch in delight as my spirit flows through you to bless others. Let yourself become a reservoir of the spirit's fruit. Your part is to live close to me, open to all that I am doing in you. Don't try to control the streaming 
of my spirit through you. Just keep focusing on me as we walk through this day together. Enjoy my presence, which permeates you with love, joy, and peace. To learn more about Gary's work with military veterans and their families, or about his book, Grateful American, visit GarySiniseFoundation.org. Stay tuned to hear from Pastor Dr. Derwin Gray after this brief message about the important work that is happening with the Gary Sinise Foundation. The Gary Sinise Foundation works to keep our defenders and their families strong each and every day. Join us as we show the pride and gratitude of our nation to all of its heroes. While we can never do enough for our defenders, veterans, first responders, and the loved ones who sacrificed right alongside them, we can always do a little more. To make a donation, visit GarySiniseFoundation.org. As a young boy, Dr. Derwin Gray grew up in poverty in a home where substance abuse and violence was all around him. When he discovered football, he found a way of escape. After earning a football scholarship, then later being drafted into the NFL, Derwin thought he was living the dream until he realized at the peak of his dreams, there wasn't the success and glamor he thought there would be waiting for him, only emptiness. With the encouragement of a teammate, Derwin gave his life to God and found the purpose he had always been searching for, which led him to found Transformation Church, a revolutionary community aiming to unite and serve people from all walks of life. My name is Derwin Gray. I'm the founding and lead pastor of Transformation Church in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. In a former life, I was a professional football player that played football for the Indianapolis Colts and the Carolina Panthers. My NFL career was from 1993 to 1998. And I am shocked and as surprised as anyone that I am a pastor and an author. I grew up unchurched, didn't own a Bible, knew nothing about Jesus, and I was a compulsive stutterer. Plus, I didn't like to read books. But when Jesus called me, when Jesus loved me, when Jesus met me, he literally put things in me and brought gifts out of me that I didn't even know that was possible. So I'm just blown away by God's grace. I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. My uh, mom was 16 when she was pregnant with me. My dad was 17. And so they were children trying to raise a child. Both of them struggled with various issues. My grandparents primarily raised me. On the west side of San Antonio, Texas, where I'm from, it was a very hard area. There was poverty. There was substance abuse. There was violence. But when you're that young and that's all you know, you think that's normal. I had normalized dysfunction. And at about age 13, I realized that football could get me out of where I was. So I got really good and I got a football scholarship to Brigham Young University, met my wife to be second semester of my freshman year, became a great football player and got drafted to the NFL. And I was like, okay, all my dreams are going to come true. I'm going to have the good life. I'm really going to be happy. And By my third year in the NFL at age 25, I said, there's got to be more to life than this. I dealt with incredible unforgiveness towards my dad and family. I dealt with uh, unforgiveness for myself. I realized I didn't have the capacity to love my wife because I didn't really love me. I struggled with fear of who would I be one day when I can't play football anymore. And so... God put a guy on the team named Steve Grant, and every day after practice, he would get his Bible and share with my teammates, do you know Jesus? It was like the strangest and coolest thing all at once. And over a five-year process, his words and his actions coincided. And as I was going through the things that I was going through from injury to guilt to shame to unforgiveness, August 2nd, 1997, in a small dorm room at Anderson College in Anderson, Indiana. It was my fifth year in the NFL training camp. After lunch, I called my wife on the phone and I said, I want to be more committed to you and I want to be committed to Jesus. And that's when I was born again. I literally felt my body change. I felt God's presence. I felt God's love. 
and I literally wept for three days and I haven't stopped loving him since. It was at the peak of my football career where I found Jesus because I climbed a mountain only to find that the things that I was looking for wasn't there. It was like I was chasing my shadow and I finally caught it, but realized it went right through my hands. And and so I was looking for things that only Jesus can give. No matter how much my wife loves me, she can't love me like Christ. And the football fans only loved me if I played good. My identity could not be just a football player because I wasn't going to be that my whole life. I needed a purpose beyond simply being good at football and making money. And so Jesus gave me those things. He gave me unconditional love. He gave me a new identity, beloved child of God. He gave me a new purpose, and that is to know him and to make him known through every facet of my life. So I never wanted to be a pastor. Even even when I came to faith, I didn't know what ministry was. I just started sharing everything that Jesus was doing in my heart, and my wife would do the same thing. So I got invited uh, the year I retired in 1999 to speak at a youth event in Columbia, South Carolina, and I argued with God about going to speak because I said, I'm a compulsive stutterer. And in the midst of me crying, I I just sensed God say, if I can raise my son from the dead, I can raise your tongue to talk. And so we went down there, myself, my wife, and our little baby girl, and I did the best I could, and a bunch of kids got saved. And then people just start calling me all the time. And as I was traveling around the country speaking, I started to notice that churches were very segregated. Like you'd have churches that were predominantly white, churches that were predominantly black. Like you never... I never ministered in a multi-ethnic church. And when I read the Bible, I seen that the early church were comprised of Jews and Gentiles. They were very multi-ethnic. And the church not only was in relationship with Jesus based on love, but now enemies became family, foes became friends because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God promised Abraham a multi-ethnic family. And so I began to ask pastors, like, why isn't there more multi-ethnic churches? And God said, well, do something about it. And so 10 years ago, we planted Transformation Church, and we are an intentionally Jesus-centered church. We preach the gospel. We preach grace, his love, his transformative power. And we're a church that looks like the new heavens is going to look. Every nation, tribe, and tongue. We've seen thousands of people come to faith. We've baptized thousands of people. Also, our church is probably leading the city of Charlotte in understanding mental health. We have a mental health ministry. We're on the front lines of teaching uh, racial reconciliation through the gospel. And so God has been very, very generous to us. And so we're seeing people transformed in beautiful ways by Jesus. And we're just thankful to be a part of it. Inspired by his beautiful church family, Dr. Gray reads about the all-encompassing way Jesus loves us in a passage of Jesus Calling. Jesus Calling, November 5th. You can live as close to me as you choose. I set up no barriers between us, neither do I tear down barriers that you erect. People tend to think their circumstances determine the quality of their lives. So they pour their energy into trying to control those situations. They feel happy when things are going well and sad or frustrated when things don't turn out as they'd hoped. They rarely question this correlation between the circumstances and feelings. Yet it is possible to be content in any and every situation. Put more energy into trusting me and enjoying my presence. Don't let your well-being depend on your circumstances. Instead, connect your joy to my precious promises. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will meet all your needs according to my glorious riches. Nothing in all of creation will be able to separate you from my love. So the new book is called The Good Life, What Jesus Teaches About Finding True Happiness. 
And basically what I want to do is I want people to sit down with Jesus, let him call them near. And so I wrote the good life so people could experience the happiness they were created for and the holiness that they were meant for. That happiness and holiness are two sides of the same coin. As we're more satisfied in Jesus, we reflect his holiness. And as we reflect Jesus's holiness, we begin to develop his kind of happiness. One of the things that's so beautiful about Jesus is that he will allow us to hit rock bottom so we can discover that he is the rock. And so often we are so self-sufficient that we can't be God sufficient. So often we're centered upon ourselves. We can't be Jesus centered. The reality is this is grace only works in a broken heart. And so it's It's about a posture of the heart of saying, God, I need you. I need your strength. I need you to do this. And we live in a world that's based on competition, that's based on achievement, that's based on measuring up, that's based on being good enough. And we wear ourselves out. And Jesus is saying, I am your good enough. Everything that we would ever hope to be is found in a person of Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't need us to do stuff for him. Jesus wants to live in us. Jesus wants to live through us. So he gave his life for us to give his life to us, to live his life through us. I believe that there needs to be more talk about Jesus and what he's done and less talk about what we have to do. Because when we understand what Jesus has done, when we understand his grace, his mercy, his love, his kindness, his presence, his power, that's like rocket fuel that moves us to love the world. To read more about Derwin's story, mission, and book, please visit derwinlgray.com. And to see more of the work that Transformation Church is doing in their community, please visit transformationchurch.tc. If you'd like to hear more stories about people using their lives to help others, check out our interview with NFL's Mark Herzlick and his wife, Danielle Herzlick. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we talk with mixed martial artist Paige Van Zandt. As a fighter, Paige stretches herself to go beyond her comfort zone and recently stepped outside the ring to try new opportunities like competing on Dancing with the Stars and Food Network's Chopped. She shares why she uses her God-given abilities this way. I think it's extremely important to push yourself to try new things because God's given you all these talents and why waste them? I want to feel like I'm really living up to my full God-given potential and I'm going to go for any dream that comes my way. Do you love hearing these stories of faith weekly from people like you whose lives have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then be sure to subscribe to the Jesus Calling Stories of Faith podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like what you're hearing, leave us a review so that we can reach others with these inspirational stories. And you can also see these interviews on video as part of our original web series, with a new interview premiering every other Sunday on Facebook Live. Find previously broadcast interviews on our YouTube channel on IGTV or on JesusCalling.com slash video.